Welcome to Live Happy, Eat Dirty, a podcast full of quick and dirty health and diet ideas for real people, hosted by me, Kate Harrison. Keep listening for the latest weird and wonderful ideas and interviews from the worlds of psychology, nutrition and more. If you loathe detoxes and clean eating, but love evidence-based tips and eating well, you're in the right place. Because you can be slim without giving up cheese, you can be fit without ever trying a triathlon, and you can enjoy your life without having to be a saint. Ditch the guilt. A happy, dirty life is so much more fun. Here's today's show. Hello and welcome to today's podcast where we are handing over to you guys. Yes, we're going to answer some of your questions all about gut health, diet, 5-2 fasting and more. We're covering a great range of topics today because of that from cellulite to the ketogenic diet plus how to bring the gut back to good health after surgery and medication plus the ideal timing for eating and especially for enjoying kefir and fruit. With me to give us the benefit of her knowledge and expertise is Helen Fadness, our Dirty Diet registered dietitian and expert in all things food and health related. Welcome back, Helen. Thanks very much, Kate. Good to be here. So let's get started with a question from Emma Robinson, who says, Hi, Kate and Helen. I would like more information about replenishing gut health. I've had surgery, but before that, I was taking 30 plus tablets a day and had terrible bowel habits. I'm almost medication free, just thyroxin for an underactive thyroid, but I want to get gut healthy again. Is there an optimal mix of dirty, healthy foods to speed this up, or is it better to go slowly? So, Helen, this one is a great one for you, I think, because you worked with patients pre and post surgery all the time when you were in the NHS. Obviously, every condition has slightly different needs, but when it comes to recovery, what are some of the good principles to follow? Yeah, so it's important to say that every operation is different and to listen to the advice from your medical team. But overall, the sooner you get to eating and drinking and walking around after surgery, the quicker your recovery will be. And this is a big focus in hospitals over the past few years. It's called Enhanced Recovery After Surgery, or ERAS. And so immediately after surgery, um, that's the most important thing. It sounds like Emma's been home for a little while, and so is further along from that. And I would really recommend following the basic principles of the dirty diet. So aiming for a balanced diet based on regular meals, gradually building up your fruit and vegetable intake to a level that you can tolerate. So that's anywhere between five and 10 portions of fruit and vegetables a day. And to include probiotic foods such as yogurt on a daily basis. And these are these are basic healthy principles that can really be followed long term and, and are healthy for long term. In the shorter term, um, to get as she describes, speeding it up or to, to get going a bit quicker, she could also take a probiotic or polybiotic such as VSL number three for a month if her bowel habits are still disruptive. If, if her bowel habits are normal, um, then I'd say that that isn't necessary. That does make sense. And those are the polybiotics. You can get hold of those from specialist websites or even Amazon, in fact. So just take a look at those. They're a bit more expensive than the ones you buy over the counter and they have to be kept in the fridge to ensure that all of those healthy bacteria are still able to reach your gut ideally. Um, But as you say, that can be a really good short-term supplement for people. In terms of coming back after surgery, I guess, I mean, a lot of people are tired and just getting some of that energy back. And I know we've talked in the past about using some of the uh, foods that are available in the supermarket, the pre-prepared foods, things like stir fries or soups and those kind of thing. People often think those are lazy, but they can still be a really good option, especially if you're not feeling like you, you, you're you back to your normal self, can't they? 
Yes, absolutely. I've got um, nothing against uh, pre-prepared foods and um, uh, and just to think logically, really, as long as the components of that food um, are healthy, lots of fruit and vegetables, um, then not to feel guilty about not preparing it yourself. Things like meal soups are nice and easy and balanced. So that that's a good thing. And and also if you're not managing to eat eat such large quantities and that's an issue, then eating little and often and and having a break maybe from intermittent fasting if that's what you've been doing and following and missing out on your snacks and instead sticking to three main meals and three snacks every day and eating every couple of hours until you're back to full health, maintaining your weight. And then you can go back to the other principles of intermittent fasting for your health. I always see fasting, intermittent fasting, and all of these principles as principles. They're not rules. They're not set in stone. And we have to be aware of what our body needs. So if after surgery, we need to put some weight back on again, or we haven't got that big appetite, then finding a way to ease ourselves back into a healthy diet is is always got to be the number one priority. Um, I get very nervous when people say you have to eat the same way for the rest of your life because we've got different needs and they change. So we're going to move on from that a little bit from a question from Jamie Graves, who says, thank you very much for the podcast. Well, it's a pleasure. Jamie's question is, what is your opinion on combining the principles of 5-2 and the dirty diet with a low carb ketogenic diet? Now, Helen, we have talked about low carb in a whole podcast before. But as a reminder, if people haven't heard that, can you define a low carb diet and then what makes a ketogenic diet a bit different yes so low carb diets focus on cutting down or eliminating high carbohydrate foods such as bread cereals rice pasta sugar so normally when we eat carbohydrates they're used as our main energy source and fats aren't needed and therefore they're stored what happens with a low carbohydrate or a ketogenic diet is the body's metabolism switches to fat burning and it's called ketogenic is when the body runs on low carbohydrate for energy it breaks down fats in the liver to form ketones for energy it seems to be a bit more of a, a trendy thing at the moment for me personally some of those rules around that are a bit too restrictive and I do have my concerns for some people about it cutting out a lot of the the good fibre that we can get through a lot of carbohydrates and also we do know now from research that you can get some really beneficial uh, carbohydrates through uh, pre-cooked and then reheated carbs that are often cut out of a, a calorie controlled diet so things like potatoes in a potato salad or rice that's been reheated that's my view on it where do you stand on on the sort of more extreme end of the low carbing helen and and specifically on ketogenic dieting so low carb and ketogenic diets have uh, are fantastic for some people so for instance many athletes are advocate, advocates of this type of diet and I see particularly endurance athletes um, and ultramarathon runners, which are people who run a distance longer than a marathon in competition, particularly benefit from this. And this is because they regularly train to the point where you run out of carbohydrate stores. And that point is, is called hitting the wall. And within sporting circles, um, when you hit the wall and you switch to a fat metabolism from um, from carbohydrate metabolism, it's called the bonk. And many athletes reach that point, um, they bonk, and then they feel that they can just keep on going from that point onwards. So with these longer distances, it's more efficient to carry less lighter weight, but more calorific food, so high fat foods to keep you going. And low carbohydrate diets can also be really effective in people who are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Um, They're really good at lowering blood sugar levels. But it is important to think of the foods that you're replacing the carbohydrates with to make this sort of diet healthy. So if you're having a high fat diet, uh, is it lots of 
saturated fats that you're having or are you eating lots of lovely monounsaturated fats um, in the form of avocados, nuts, seeds, oily fish um, to make this healthy. Also, as you mentioned, fiber is a key component of carbohydrate foods and we need this to keep our gut bacteria healthy and to give us a steady supply of energy. And so this actually is the main reason why I'm not very keen on low carbohydrate diets for the majority of people, for those people who are not doing it for an endurance sport, who are not doing it for controlling blood sugar levels and diabetes. Um, I often see clients come through to my, my clinics um, who have tried low carbohydrate, carbohydrate diets, found them not maintainable in the long term and reporting symptoms of low mood, um, initial weight loss and then plateauing sugar cravings, being tired all the time, and broken sleep patterns. Uh, so for this reason, I would advocate whole grain, slow release carbohydrates, such as oats, sweet potatoes, or brown rice at each meal in the correct portion size. And that would be uh, the size of your fist. So with a lot of people, if you make a fist and you look at that and you imagine that as pasta, or rice, that seems like a very small portion, but actually that's all our bodies need. And often people aren't going wrong in the way that they are eating carbohydrates and that that's bad. It's just the quantity of carbohydrates that they're eating. Yes, that fist guideline is a great one. And we're talking actually also about that as being the, the cooked quantity, aren't we? So uh, not the raw quantity because it would be a big difference there was also a recent program just while we're on the topic of carbs um on the bbc one looking at carbs and that was making the very valid point i think that we do differ quite a lot in how our bodies respond to carbohydrates both as a result of our genes but also as a result of the bacteria that are in our gut there was a suggestion which i haven't tried actually of eating a plain cracker and judging from how much your taste changed as you ate that cracker so if it um, became quite sweet in the course of eating it within about 30 seconds and that could be an indicator that you are more able to handle carbs than people that don't so what's your advice is is it along those lines that some of us might be more susceptible to carbs than others yes absolutely and i think that's why there's always this big mystery of which the best diet for weight loss you know that million dollar question and it's not so straightforward it's different for every single person that's why it gets so complicated we've all got different dna and um there's this fantastic new field of nutrigenomics where you can get your dna tested to find out what meta your metabolism is like and how susceptible you are to carbohydrates and does that um cause um, high insulin le levels and for you to lay down fat or not um, and should you be following a higher fat diet maybe um, but these tests can get um, very costly and instead uh, you can learn by trial and error but also you can learn a lot from your family history so do you have family history of diabetes do you have a family history of obesity if you've got diabetes in the family, it would be wise to watch your carbohydrate portions. And again, thinking about that fist size portion of carbohydrates and choosing refined whole grain varieties over uh, unrefined, sorry, whole grain varieties over the refined carbs. It makes perfect sense. And yeah, family history and trial and error are those things that many of us kind of can make really sound judgments based on rather than having to yeah spend quite a lot of money on testing a couple of quick ones to just whiz through and partly because we've covered some of this already we had a question from heather black who said that she follows a gluten-free diet and prefers to use ribita and oat cakes instead of gluten-free bread is that doable or is there another option uh not found yet and she talked a little bit about the fact that she did want to keep losing weight she's got another five seven pounds or so to lose just turned 60 and finding the weight is hard to lose especially if she can't exercise apart from yoga due to me so obviously within the dirty diet we're emphasizing gut health we were she's really asking there i guess about the benefits of gluten-free bread versus oats and rivita what would be your advice to heather on this one it's tricky to know without Heather being here to ask her a little bit more about why she has cut out gluten. If she is celiac, 
uh, and then she shouldn't be having any gluten at all. That Rivita is actually made in a factory that processes weeds, and so there would be some cross contamination there. Um, or maybe she's been through the low FODMAP diet and she's intolerant uh, to wheat, but that would be something different to gluten. Cutting out gluten shouldn't necessarily negatively affect your gut health. So if you're replacing those gluten-containing foods with high fibre alternatives, like Heather is, with the oats and the rye, as long as they're not cross-contaminated, um, then that's going to be a good thing. And of course, there are plenty of gluten-free alternatives other than these highly refined gluten-free bread biscuits and those kind of products. So um, corn tortillas... Uh, would be a good alternative. They've got a nice amount of fibre in. Rye bread, although it just needs to be tri- um, to be careful because they're often not completely gluten-free. Having sweet potato at lunchtime, just popping it in the microwave. Corn thins or rice cakes are other alternatives. So there's plenty of other alternatives there, but I would not advocate cutting out gluten just for weight loss. It reduces the variety of your diet, which means that your gut health could suffer. That's a really good point there. So I hope that helps Heather. We've got two questions left. The first one is from Rosalyn Van. And although she asked a few different things, I think we're really talking about meal timing. She is planning her daily routines with a dirty diet and she's focused on that timing. She's talking the questions she's got here are things like when she should end the fast in 168, which is where you have an eight hour eating window it's an option within all kinds of diet but it's it's not necessarily something you have to follow she wants to talk about what snacking actually amounts to and if there's a good time to take her daily dose of kefir in practical terms she's saying that she always starts the day with a white coffee because she um, can't drink it black does this affect the fast Uh, then her next lunch might be uh, her next meal might be lunch and she wants to include a piece of fruit but because she might feel full after eating uh, and might want to leave it an hour or so does this then affect insulin and in the body and then the final thing is around the fact that she takes her shot of kefir once a day which she says is helping no end but she's not consistent sometimes it's in the morning sometimes before she goes to bed as she forgot it earlier is it better to be consistent or are the benefits better when taken with food or after so to sum up what's quite a complicated question she's really talking i think here a lot about insulin and how our bodies respond after eating and drinking different things wondered what your thoughts would be overall on that yes yeah, so after eating our bodies produce insulin to help us process the carbohydrates in our food and our bodies do get used to receiving food at particular times of the day which means if we eat within that routine the insulin response is more sensitive and the calories are less likely to be laid down as fat so it would be good if Rosalyn could stick to a a particular pattern there. She doesn't really need to um, get worried about, you know, having a piece of fruit an hour after lunch. Um, she, She certainly shouldn't be eating if she's not hungry. So absolutely, she should just have her lunch and then eat the fruit later. Don't worry about that being snacking. Um, that can just be a routine that is specific for her that her body gets used to and that's fine and the timing of the kefir can be at any meal or snack um, just not with a very hot drink or a very hot meal as we don't want to kill all of those lovely bacteria within it and she um, as to the drink that she has her hot drink with a splash of milk that's absolutely fine during the past the fast period just a splash of milk is not going to uh, produce huge amounts of insulin it's not going to ruin a fast or anything like that so she she doesn't need to change that but yes if she can get into a routine our bodies get used to the cycle of hunger Uh, we're less likely to overeat then and our body's more able to digest the food effectively when it comes. Great so whatever you're doing Rosalind already and uh, you've detailed it in for us uh, and if it's working for you keep at it and that's what we always say about all these things find out what works for you and if it's something you can stick to then that is going to be the best diet for you. The final question we have is not 
five two related particularly or dirty diet related but it is one thing that many women including me can relate to and feel uh, self-conscious about especially at this time of year when it's summer and that is cellulite so this is the lumpy dimpling pattern of fat that most often shows on our thighs and hips and bottom but it can apply on the arms too it looks a bit like orange peel and men luckily enough seem largely unaffected so tracy has asked this question she's a size 10 to 12 which is okay she says I would say that's very good and she has however cellulite all over her arms legs and bum how can I help to try and get rid of it I hate it I eat pretty healthy diet rarely drink alcohol although I love my diet iron brew maybe that's the problem I try to drink two liters of water a day as well hope you can help thanks in advance so Helen yeah what is cellulite why does it affect women worse than men and uh, can we get rid of it so cellulite is basically fat cells pushing against the skin and causing it to dimple it forms around puberty and because of our hormones women naturally lay down more fat stores than men and so we're more likely to have cellulite so if tracy's already eating healthily uh, it might be that she needs to focus more on exercising regularly and getting that at least 30 minutes of exercise in five times a week that might help uh, from a diet point of view, there is no magic cure. Um, just eating healthily. I wonder if Tracy has yo-yo dieted in the past. Cellulite is more common once you've yo-yo dieted. Of course, once you form new fat cells, they don't go anywhere. They just, um, if you lose weight again, they just shrink. So I, I'm not sure if that's within her weight history that might be a cause. I would certainly say she would need to address her intake of iron brew. So although it's diet, it's those sweeteners within there that would be negatively affecting her gut health. So although this question is about cellulite, I would say that for the sake of her overall health, um, she would look at reducing her intake of sweeteners through the iron brew. The problem with sweeteners is, is that they are naturally sweeter than actual sugar. And then when you go to eat sweet foods, they don't taste quite sweet enough. Can lead to, that can lead to overeating or to sugar cravings. And for the first time last year, a connection was made between diet drinks and increased risk of diabetes. So clearly they do have a metabolic effect on the body and they're not completely safe. And the caffeine intake is something to watch out for as well. And that's why these, these um, diet colas or diet iron brews um, are very addictive. Definitely try to limit to two caffeinated drinks a day and no more than that. And if she can cut down, if she's drinking quantities more than that, the caffeine may just be being a prop and her body needs to adjust to not having quite so much caffeine. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, I, I agree with you about the sweetened drinks. We're not really singling out diet iron brew. We're singling out all, all drinks and all foods that contain some of these sweeteners. And I used to drink quite a lot of those. And I have to say that I uh, have almost eliminated them from my diet very occasionally if I am the designated driver or if I'm going out and there's nothing else to choose I might sneak the odd diet coke but it's it's definitely an occasional an occasional thing rather than a regular part of my diet or my uh, drinking habits. Uh, Helen thanks so much for joining us we covered a lot of different topics but it was great to hear your take on those. You're very welcome. And don't forget, if you do want to get in touch with Helen, you can go to her website, nomnomnerd.com, where she has lots of tips on things like reaching 10 a day, snacking, recipes and more besides. And you can also get in contact to make a personal consultation with her anywhere in the world because she does some down video and very interesting she is too on all these topics. For more on eating well without banning any foods, you can read The Dirty Diet, Ditch the Guilt, Love Your Food, and you can find out more about lots of these different topics on the website the 5-2 dietbook.com or download a sample of any of the books via Amazon. That's it for today's Live Happy, Eat Dirty. For free tools and tips to help you live a gloriously imperfect way of life, go to the dirty-diet.com or find us on Facebook forward slash the dirty diet. You can also tweet me at Kate Wright's Books. 
and do have a happy and dirty day.